All right, you guys, uh, for this lecture, uh, we're gonna try something that I haven't used before. Uh, this, uh, this lecture is all about foreign policy in the 1790s during what we would call the Federalist era. So we're gonna look at foreign policy in the Washington years, and then after his presidency ends, we're gonna see John Adams. Uh, the things that will show up in this lecture, we'll quickly touch on the Neutrality Proclamation. We'll talk a little bit about um, a couple treaties during the Washington years, Jay's Treaty, Pinckney's Treaty, and Washington's Farewell Address. Um, and then when we get to Adams, we'll talk about uh, what was called the Quasi-War with France, the XYZ Affair, and then some of the ramifications of that, which are the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, I'm going to use uh, these PowerPoints. I didn't make this PowerPoint. This is from the American pageant, so this should go right along with your text. Um, and you know, I didn't put myself on the screen to talk for this one. I'm just going to kind of, I won't read it word for word, but if you, if there's anything on a slide that you need, obviously you can just pause it and, and look at that slide as long as you need to. Um, so here we go. Washington's Neutrality Proclamation. Uh, Washington proclaims neutrality. Uh, the, the Jeffersonians or the Democratic Republicans are going to be upset uh, and the British Federalists are going to feel better about it. Um, one response, and I don't think I mentioned this in class to the students who were here on Friday, is something that's known as the Genet, I think that's how you say it, Genet Affair. Uh, Edmund Genet, he's a, a representative of the New French Republic, uh, and he comes right after the Neutrality Proclamation, and he says, you know what, I don't think that most people, uh, especially people in the South, agree with this, and so he just ignores it. And he, um, he stirs up uh, American public sentiment to be anti-Britain and pro-France and even starts trying to recruit, recruit Americans to be part of military action. Uh, Washington is furious. He feels like this is a slap in the face from the, the French uh, representative. He demands Genet's withdrawal, which uh, Genet is withdrawn, uh, although I think he's kind of shamed the new French Republic and he has to seek asylum, Genet actually, I believe, lives out the rest of his life uh, in America as like a disgraced ambassador. You can double check that. Uh, I'm not 100% on that fallout, but, um, but that's uh, an interesting thing known as the Genet Affair. Okay, uh, well, what about uh, our relationship with Great Britain? Uh, we're having trouble on that side with France. What about Great Britain? Well, um, neutrality hurts our relationship with the British as well. Uh, one thing that Britain is doing that really upsets uh, the, the the Democratic Republic Republicans is that there are these forts. Um, there is a a chain of northern posts that are are still in the American Northwest. This next slide I think has a map. Um, so there are. Let's see if I can. Oh, didn't mean to do that. There are these locations here in the old Northwest Territory where British troops are still holding. Um, camp. And these forts were supposed to be evacuated um, after the Treaty of Paris 1783, but British troops stayed, and there's rumors or at least indications that they are helping Native Americans um, when Native Americans are fighting Americans for land, um, giving them weapons and, and intelligence and things like that. So, um, Oh, and in addition, uh, out on the high seas where there's a lot of wartime uh, conquest and, and competition because of the British and French War, American ships are being seized and American soldiers are being impressed, forced into naval service for the British. So um, Washington in 1794 sends John Jay to England to, to kind of work out a treaty um, about the 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 forts in the old Northwest, the, the British seizing ships and impressing soldiers or, or American sailors. And Jay gets something known as Jay's Treaty. Uh, it actually does very little to address those issues. Uh, the very last thing on this slide says Jay won few concessions. Jay's Treaty um, is extremely unpopular. Um, you know, Britain promises to evacuate forts. Uh, yeah, that's great, but you were supposed to do that you know, over 10 years ago, um, uh, consented to pay damages for past seizures of American ships, but there's no promise of saying that this won't continue to happen or to go on in the future. Um, 
and I think I said this uh, to students in class, Jay's treaty is kind of the event that really formulates the two political parties. They were emerging up until this point. This is the thing that kind of draws the line in the sand and says, okay, now we're Federalists and Republicans. Um, even Washington's popularity is hurt. Um, and then that's an interesting part here at the bottom. Fearing an Anglo-American alliance, Spain offers to do deal favorably with the U.S. Um, this leads to something called Pinckney's Treaty. Um, so you need to know Jay's Treaty, but you also need to know Pinckney's Treaty. Um, Pinckney's Treaty is a treaty that we made with Spain that gave us free navigation of the Mississippi, warehouse rights at New Orleans, um, and a little bit of territory in western Florida. Um, ever since the Treaty of Paris, we had been in competition with Spain for the right of deposit at New Orleans and the use of the, the, the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River was kind of serving as our western boundary. Um, and this treaty is a, is a good treaty for Washington in that it secures that boundary, gives us access and a right to use the port of New Orleans. Uh, this is kind of the final thing for Washington. He steps down, but he is going to pin uh, a farewell address. And Washington's farewell address is, is another one of those precedents. Most presidents ever since then have always kind of had their, their, their final farewell address. And the two big things that you want to know um, that, that he, he mentions is he strongly uh, advises against permanent alliances. People like to say that America has a rich tradition of isolationism for much of the 1800s. I don't know how much that's true. Um, it does work uh, in, in certain arguments, um, but it is true that America uh, avoids peacetime military alliances from now, 1796, all the way up until the Cold War in the 1940s. So for a long time, America will avoid those permanent peacetime military alliances. Um, Washington called them entangling alliances. The other thing that he warns a lot about, I don't know if there's a slide for it, is political parties. As these political parties emerge, uh, Washington says you have to beware of faction and partisan allegiance over country allegiance. Um, France is very upset with Jay's treaty. Um, uh, French warships start doing a lot of the same things that British warships were doing, seizing defenseless American vessels and impressing American soldiers. What's going to be interesting is um, uh, during the Washington years, the Democratic Republicans want to go to war with Britain. During the Adams years, Federalists are going to want to go to war with France. It's going to kind of flip once uh, we shift administrations. Um, when France is seizing American ships and impressing American soldiers, uh, John Adams sends diplomats. Uh, John Marshall, who will later be a chief justice, he's going to be part of this diplomatic team to meet with, with the French. Well, the French send out three uh, diplomats, and we're, they're called X, Y, and Z. And these diplomats, X, Y, and Z, they say before John Marshall and his team can even start to negotiate, we want a payment. We want a bribe or a tribute, uh, $250,000 um, for the privilege of merely talking with the French. Uh, Marshall is insulted. He thinks America is not being treated as a real nation, uh, and he refuses. Um, here's a political cartoon about it. And Marshall returns uh, and says, you know, how can you believe these French who are trying to to bribe us. This becomes known as the XYZ affair. Federalists are furious. Federal, Federalists now want to go to war uh, with France. Uh, the slogan is, we'll pay millions for defense to build up our army and our navy, but not one cent for tribute. Um, uh, during this time, uh, this will, will begin to be called the quasi-war. There will never be a formal deck formal declaration of war against France during this time, but between 1798 and 1800, uh, there will be lots of conflict and like many skirmishes. Um, America creates our Navy department. Uh, so um, the executive branch uh, is expanding um, and now we'll have a Navy department. 
Uh, the Marine Corps is established. We start to raise an army, 10,000 men, and they're even going to bring Hamilton and and Washington, Washington out of retirement to, to possibly lead uh, men into battle if we go to war with France. Um, technically, though, um, we still had our, our treaty. Um, uh, we still had our, our positive uh, relationship with France, and so that has to be um, handled. Uh, and eventually in 1800, um, it says Adams puts patriotism above party. And that's kind of like what um, Washington had said in his farewell address. Uh, they meet um, the, the French alliance that we had from the revolution will be ended. It will be annulled. Um, and um, it says Adams deserves immense credit for his belated push for peace. Um, I believe the treaty is called the Treaty of Montfontaine. Um, I don't know if that's on this slide. Um, the last thing that I want to get after the XYZ affair, almost going to war with France, uh, but then cooler heads prevailing, is how does this impact the country back home? The Federalist. John Adams is a Federalist. Um, he had a, a Federalist majority in Congress. They pass a couple of laws during this quasi-war with France. It was called uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Alien dealing with immigrants and foreigners and sedition dealing with freedom of speech, freedom of speech and press. Uh, many new immigrants coming in uh, to America were going to side with the Republicans and si the side with France. So um, the Federalists tried to make it harder for, um, for those immigrants to get um, citizenship and naturalize and, and to actually have a voice in government. So they, they raised the residence requirement to four, from five to 14 years. This violates the traditional policy of speedy assimilation. It, it's making it harder for immigrants to go through the naturalization process. Sedition Act says if you criticize um, the president, if you criticize the Federalist policies, that you could be imprisoned or fined. You know, this is very much against things in the Bill of Rights like um, freedom of speech and freedom of press. As a result, and this will be the last thing, um, Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, they go to their home states, uh, or at least um, favorable territories, Kentucky and Virginia, and they write up these things called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Um, the Virginia Resolutions and the Kentucky Resolutions, these are... Um, they stress what's called the compact theory, that our government is actually an agreement of states and that there are certain powers reserved to states. And if the federal government oversteps its bounds and violates um, uh, the Constitution or violates a state's right, the state can then nullify the action of um, the federal government. This idea of nullification is is a big deal. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit in class. What can states do to get back power from the federal government if they feel the, the federal government is abu abusing its power? Well, here we go. Um, Virginia and Kentucky feel like the Alien and Sedition Acts are wrong, so they're going to try to nullify them. Um, it says no other state legislatures fell into line. Um, Federalists said this isn't allowed. Um, but, um, and it says it's only up to the Supreme Court to, to nullify unconstitutional legislation. Um, this is part of the issue. We are a new country, and we are just kind of figuring this out. Um, if the legislator does something unconstitutional, well, it's up to the Supreme Court to interpret that, but that's never been done before at this point. The, the Supreme Court has never um, declared something unconstitutional before. So can states do that? That's what the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were, were arguing. Um, these were brilliant formulations of extreme states' rights views, um, and they, would have, they ended up having more sweeping implications than the authors intended. Later on, when we talk about things like the tariff, uh, there will be a nullification crisis in the 1830s and eventually the Civil War. Some of the, those ideals of secession and nullification build off these documents. Um, and of course, around the same time, 
uh, after Adams leaves office, we're going to get an important court case called uh, Marbury versus Madison, which establishes the principle of judicial review. And that's the first time that the Supreme Court will actually strike down a law as unconstitutional, kind of asserting that viewpoint. All right. Um, kind of got off track a little bit here at the end about uh, nullification and, and things like that, but it is connected foreign policy. I hope this made sense um, and uh, just something different using the, the textbook PowerPoint. Thanks for listening um, and I will see you guys later.